So a few different considerations for our writing. Um, I don't want to sit here and say you should do this instead of that, but just some things to consider because ultimately this is your, your piece of writing that needs to speak to you. But I just wanted to raise a few things that are commonly asked about when it comes to developing key selection criteria responses. So the first one is, should I use lots of different examples or should I use fewer and include more detail? Should I address multiple aspects of the criterion or just address one aspect? Should I use dot points to help add to my examples or should I write examples fully? Should I include non-classroom experience or just reference specific experience? Should I mention things I haven't done or only reference what I have done? So with all those thoughts going through our heads, that can feel a little bit confusing. So let's start with the first one. When it comes to um, providing examples, we want to make sure that we can find a balance between um, using different examples, maybe to reflect um, different types of experiences that we've had. Maybe you're an English and drama teacher, so you want one example to reflect what you've done in the English classroom and one that you've done in the drama classroom. Um, perhaps you've had uh, a couple of different roles or different setting types that you've worked with. So maybe you do want to have a few different examples that are showing the one thing but in a couple of different ways. But what we don't want to do is go through a grocery list of things that we've done without being able to go into detail in, with any of those things. Um, there is a balance between the two. So generally when we do write our criteria responses, we should be aiming to have one page per criterion. So at the end, you should have a five to six page document. So in a way, we do need to be quite economical with <laughs> the way that we um, explore different things. So what we would usually suggest is if you've got a couple of different examples to reflect um, one aspect of the that criterion, um, it should be about two or three examples to help you to be able to explain things well, but also um, show varied experience that you've had. Another thing that I would suggest is you're not, if you're looking at having a few different examples, it's also very difficult at the same time to try and reflect on every single part of the criterion. As we saw, they are quite meaty um, and even breaking them down, we identified a few different areas. So even going back to that. So in the first one, for example, we're looking at curriculum knowledge in general, we're looking at literacy and numeracy, and we're looking at differentiation. So if you were going to try and have multiple examples for all three of those things, that's where that grocery list can come out a little bit. So it is that decision making. If you've got one particular part of the criterion that you're drawn to in terms of something you really value or a lot of experience that you've had, I would run with that. So having multiple examples for one aspect of the criterion. So when it comes to dot points, there is definitely a good way to use dot points and a not so effective way to use dot points. Where we can use dot points is where we maybe want to list off a few different things that we intend to go um, into more detail later. What we don't want is for dot points to exist there and then they're plonked there and moved on from. So they're not given any context. Um, and that could be to not be able to show your understanding of what those different things mean. But also um, something that we see quite often with key selection criteria responses is that um, we'll read through them and recognise I actually haven't been given enough information to be able to picture this situation or understand your meaning to a degree. Um, oh, you've started to talk about it, I'd like to know more, but you've already moved on. So I wanna know, you know, what was the result of that experience or ultimately what impact did you have from that experience or what was your takeaway from that that's going to inform more professional development for yourself. If um, you've had a lot of dot points that you've then moved on from, the result of that is that you're potentially going to leave your reader with a lot of questions. Um, and again, it could just muddy the waters a little bit for them to be able to understand your experience and align that with the role that you're applying for. So when it comes to um, non-classroom based experience, there are definitely some things that are relevant. So if you've had um, roles in um, 
different settings within education or a different um, education based roles, I should say, or you're a new teacher, um, there are different experiences that you can draw from. So don't be too, um, I guess, stifled by feeling as though you're, you're limited to your classroom experience. Something that um, has been mentioned by schools is if they have two applications and then they can see that you've roughly taught the same amount of time as somebody else, um, you've got a similar education, the thing that they'll be asking about is what separates you. So sometimes we need to be looking beyond the classroom to really show how we can add value to a school setting. So thinking about our uh, passion areas. So again, using the English and drama example, um, you might be really into tennis. So you've had a lot of involvement in, in a tennis club, you've done a little bit of coaching, which again is educational teaching related. Um, you've helped to mentor other coaches. So you're not only showing different um, involvement you've had from an education perspective, but the school will also be able to say, well, hey, we have a great tennis program. This is something extracurricular that this person could get involved with. So you're helping to um, explore points of difference. It can also be experiences that you haven't had yet necessarily. So that draws onto that last point. So if, what, how can I mention things that I haven't done before? Can I only reference things that I have done? Another piece of feedback we get from schools is around, they want to see that you're eager to learn as well. So what are some goals that you have for professional development? What are some experiences you've had where you've realized I have gaps in my knowledge or um, that this is actually something that's really important to me that I'm really passionate about. I, I think it's important to show that through your responses as well because um, we, we might be really suitable to a school setting but we will continue to learn and develop while we're working in that setting as well. So we always want to show that school how we're planning on doing that or we're already a step ahead and we're thinking about that. You're not going to be that perfect cookie cutter size for that particular school. And you also don't wanna come across as if I've had loads of experience, I've been there, I've done that, I'm all good. I don't have anything else to learn. <laughs> we don't wanna convey that at all. So um, I guess what all that boils down to in terms of best practice is in our overall response, we wanna make sure that we are specific we want to make sure that we're descriptive so we can almost paint a picture of a situation. We want to be professional in our writing, but also personable. We want to show how and why. So there's a writing technique that we'll talk about shortly, which will help you to do that. Um, as I mentioned, avoiding the grocery list, we don't want to feel as though we've hit a really good point or we've hinted at an experience we've had and then we're moving on straight away. Um, so actually stopping and thinking about the how I did that and why I did that or even what was the result of that was will help us to flesh things out in more detail and paint a better picture of the situation. We wanna show range and diversity. So again, if we've had different roles, um, if we've got different subject areas, if we've worked in different types of settings, um, if we've had classroom and non-classroom experience, we want to have a range of those different examples through our overall response and include other experiences as well. Um, mention future goals. And then we also want to adapt the application for each school. I do wanna bring it back to explain though that you don't need to start from scratch each time. So um, we probably find that we'll be applying for a few different roles for different reasons. It could be that we have multiple things that appeal to us or over time, um, we might just find that we're applying for a lot of roles depending on um, sort of competition, demand, etc. So um, what we want to create is a working document. So as I mentioned before, if we have five or six uh, criterion to respond to and we're aiming to have one page per um, criterion, we have a big document on our hands. So what I don't want you to have to go through each time is rewriting the whole thing. So if we're We've got a base document, which again sort of speaks to us and our experience. It responds to those typical um, criteria that we'll come across. We wanna make sure we're taking the step beforehand of that research of the school. 
um, research of key terms, etc. So that when we come to submit the key selection criteria response for this particular school, that we've had a look at it, we've maybe made some changes to some certain ones, um, and then we've submitted the document that has a bit of editing to align to that particular school. So that could be um, pulling out or um, swapping in different examples, or you might actually pick one criterion that you adapt to each school as well. So um, an idea for that is potentially uh, looking at uh, sort of community-wide engagement. That could be an opportunity to look at that particular school's um, priorities from a community standpoint, extracurricular clubs and things like that. Maybe you want to comment on those, again, if that's a particular passion area of, your, of yours. Um, or for example, if you know from Number three, that the school has a particular initiative or process for assessment and reporting. Great time to pull that in and then also adapt it to your experience. So it could be that you've got, as I said, a particular one that you um, change a little bit each time. So um, when the school reads it, they know that you've done your homework and you've taken that step to adapt it to the role. So as I mentioned before, we want to make sure that we're perhaps including a few examples to show our breadth of experience, interest areas, et cetera. But we also wanna make sure that we're providing enough details so that really the key selection criteria response serves its purpose. So it is really an extension of our CV and it doesn't feel like we're dot pointing here until next Thursday. So um, a method that can really help with that is the STAR or the STAIR method. So if you have your particular example to address one part of the criterion, um, this is some good steps to go through um, to help you to really flesh out that response. So um, first of all, we're establishing what the situation was. So perhaps what was taking place at the time, what um, problem or challenge were you facing, et cetera. Um, what was the particular task that you were undertaking? Um, so, you know, setting the scene, what was the particular thing that you were working on at the time? What were your actions or involvement? So a good area to comment there if you had particular responsibilities or ideas, or if you were functioning as part of a team, what happened within that example? What was the result, which was a really, it, it is a really important one. So we want to round it out to, um, here was the situation or the problem that we recognized. Here were some things that we put in place. Here was the result. And that doesn't necessarily have to have been <laughs> successful either, because again, we want to be able to comment on areas for growth, um, learning areas of interest, that sort of thing. So um, that's where there's that optional stare rather than star, which is extension. So um, based on that particular situation, what are some things that you want to do to grow things further or develop things further? So an example of that in action, um, I've just provided an example there, which is in reference to um, the selection criteria number one around um, curriculum, literacy, numeracy um, and student learning needs. So the situation, while teaching a year nine English class at ANCGK High School, um, I realised the need to adjust parameters of a text analysis task that the students needed to deliver for assessment. So we've got a clear idea of what were you teaching at the time? Where were you? What was the situation or problem faced? Um, so what happened at the start? Initial writing exercise revealed that many students struggled with structured writing, but upon exchanging verbal feedback, were able to communicate their intentions and ideas surrounding the task. So this helped me to recognise that I needed to offer different options for students delivering their interpretation of the text beyond the conventional essay format to allow different types of learners in the class to be successful. So based on the situation, what was the task at hand? I knew that I needed to offer different ways of delivering the task. Through consultation with the class, we generated alternative formats, which included a play script and a comic strip. The assessment rubric was similarly adjusted to reflect the demonstration of skills and understanding rather than merely displaying command of structural techniques. So what actions took place, consulted with the class, developed um, different options and also adjusted the rubric. Through this adjustment, many of the students were able to communicate through their choice of format, a deeper understanding of character, theme and language in relation to the set text than through their draft attempts at the essay. This process helped to reinforce the importance of adapting tasks for different types of learners so that they can successfully demonstrate skills and knowledge as part of the curriculum. So what was the result? Ultimately, it helped the students to convey their ideas in different ways. Um, 
so that they could demonstrate their skills. So that's um, rounding it out to sort of show the result. I didn't do the E in that, but it could have been um, potentially how I intend to um, keep that sort of in mind for tasks in the future, um, where else in the school that was implemented or how else I could implement that, maybe to different tasks or different subject areas, um, or how that could align with what the school does that I'm applying to. So that's probably where your extension would come in using that example. So that was um, a, a very brief, <laughs> it, felt, it felt like a lot of things, but not a lot of things at the same time. So um, hopefully there were some bits and pieces in there that will hopefully help you to put together your key selection criteria. Um, I was really wanting to have that general overview of, of writing advice and really to help break down the current criteria. But if you were looking for some additional information or help, there are some extra resources available to you. So as I mentioned at the start, I've um, been involved in the key selection criteria response workshops um, before. So um, one that we did last year, um, well, I'll go back. So 2019 was really focused on school advice. Um, so we had a couple of uh, sort of comments from different school settings about what they were looking for from applicants. And then 2020 um, was more of a writing based workshop where we actually had some educators contribute um, sort of little snippets of their response. And then we broke it down and explained um, sort of how they could improve their response there. So you can find the webinar recording to that one on the ANZ UK blog. If you are an active educator with ANZ UK and have access to our exceptional talent um, learning management system, we have that 2020 um, workshop available on there, but there are some additional resources and activities as um, part of an actual learning module. So you've got that accessible to yourself on the um, LMS. And what I would also suggest, um, I was fortunate enough to be involved in a panel with La Trobe University last week where um, we were speaking about different career options or what schools are looking for in applicants applying for roles. And I was able to be a part of that panel with some um, school leaders from different types of settings. So that one is um, freely available for everybody to watch the recording of that one. So if you look up the La Trobe University YouTube channel, um, it was posted last week and it's called Career Options in Education. So there was one for regional Victoria, which I was able to be involved with, but there was also one for Metro Melbourne. So it was the same questions posed, but we had different panelists involved. So um, a great one to check out as well. So a little bit of um, information that you can digest there. And so I know that we've gone through um, quite a bit of information in a short period of time. So I was really keen to see, um, based on sort of what we've just gone through, if you do have any particular questions. So I'm just going to pause for a minute or two so that you can get your thoughts together and then put those questions across in the chat. And I'll take a moment to read through them as well, um, just to pull out any particular questions we can put to the group. So. Um, please take a moment to provide your questions in that question area.
Thanks everyone. I'm just reading through some questions now. And while I'm doing that, I had a few um, comments a little bit earlier on in the presentation asking about the availability of this webinar or the availability of the slides. So I have access to the um, attendees list from this session. So what I will do is we'll make the um, PowerPoint available via email to attendees over the next couple of days, we'll be able to get that one out to you. We will also um, post the recording of this session on our blog and also pop it up on our social media pages. So if you're part of an ANZ UK group geographically, so hello North educators, um, we'll share that one um, as a Facebook post as well. So hopefully it'll be accessible in a couple of different ways, um, depending on what works best for you. So we'll make sure that we follow up with that one because as I mentioned, um, it feels a bit of a whirlwind where some of the slides had a bit of information on them, so. So um, stakeholder management was a question that came up in terms of what that refers to. So stakeholder management, um, is sort of an all-encompassing <laughs> term um, to reflect uh, different um, different stakeholders within a school community. So um, communication with your students, with their parents, with other staff members. So that could be members of your teaching team. That could be um, people um, that you've perhaps mentored or supported in a collegial perspective. It could be people above you in a position of authority. So that could be school leadership, but it could also be wider community members. So if you've had um, contacts or you've run activities and things like that outside of the school setting but were still relevant for your students or your school community, that's where you could tie those stakeholders in. So in the example before where we were talking about, um, for example, a special educational needs setting, stakeholders might look different in those sorts of settings because we may liaise with um, additional sort of community members. So if a student has a psychologist or a physical therapist, you may need to liaise um, or manage um, interactions with that person, again, to inform your teaching approach, um, the things that you implement in the classroom to add the most benefit for the student in, the, in an informed way by dealing with those stakeholders. So um, where that criterion relates is really looking at collaborative opportunities and forms of communication that you've had and what's been successful within that. Sorry, I'm just having a little technical issue where I'm seeing a lot of answers. Oh, sorry, just give me one moment. I just want to make sure that I'm addressing questions as best I can. I'll just go back while I'm doing that to the slide that had my contact details as well. So if after the presentation you were keen to um, continue the conversation with me, then I'll just make sure that you've got my details just there. So someone had asked about if you are, for example, an English and drama teacher, thanks for using my example, Ruth, um, but you're only an English teacher, can you apply for the role? Um, I would recommend, so if you're particularly interested um, in a position, so for example, the role that I applied for was an English role, um, even though I was an English and drama teacher. So again, a bit of a weird degree of separation there, Rose, but, um, it was not a graduate position and I was a graduate and it was um, an English role, but I was an English and drama teacher. So um, I was employed as an English teacher initially, but then opportunity came up while I was employed um, for me to take on a drama load as well. So again, where we're looking to um, sort of show ourselves, uh, show a bit of a point of difference. Um, English is quite a common method and can be attached with a lot of, lot of other methods as well. So for example, humanities, um, whereas if you have a different subject area, that could be something to speak to in your application as well, um, to sort of show that point of difference where you could add value to the school. So don't um, exclude yourself for applying for those roles. So it could be subject related. Sometimes we see funny subject combinations where it's almost like they're looking for a unicorn. If you're really interested in that school and you have relevance in terms of a subject area, it's still worth applying for the position. And when it comes to the graduate versus um, sort of range, higher range roles, um, you don't have to just apply for graduate positions if you're a graduate. So. Um, Again, it's just about recognising that those points of difference and then really presenting yourself well would be my biggest piece of advice. So um, someone's asked about the um, 
how long each key selection criteria. So I would be I would be pushing for the page because again we're wanting to make sure that we're really fleshing out our examples and potentially if we're looking at it, maybe addressing more than one aspect of each criterion. So as we mentioned before, by the time you actually use, for example, the STAR or the STAIR method, you've gone through a few different examples, you've looked at a couple of different aspects of that criterion, you'd be at that full page point for sure. Um, thank you so much. Just wanting to see if there are any other particular questions that I can pull out. I think my computer's packed up for the evening. <laughs> um, someone also asked about um, making contact with the school to discuss the role. Um, potentially, if you were wanting more information about the position before applying for it, um, you're able to call up the school and just say, I saw this on recruitment online, just wanting a bit more information about the particular role. Um, when it comes to, I guess, the process for shortlisting and making a decision about your success in the role, that's partly why that process on recruitment online is in place. So schools are often managing a high number of applicants. So that's where sometimes it can feel like you get a bit of an automated response if you've been successful or in being shortlisted or not. Um, and that's where it can be a little bit challenging as well if you were, if you got partway through the process but weren't successful finding some feedback. So I guess in terms of um, the process, that's where that self-reflection can be really effective or, um, you know, one thing I was going to mention as well about the writing side of things is, you know, proofreading is really important because we don't want to be making spelling mistakes. We don't want to write the wrong school <laughs> in the title of the document. Um, but we also, it can be really helpful to have somebody else proofread it to make sure that there's that understanding. So it could be somebody who is within education or it could be someone who's not. Um, uh, if someone has nothing to do with education, but they're able to sort of follow where you were at and decisions that you made and successes that you had with certain things that you implemented, you're probably on the right track with how you've um, explained that. So using people around us in order to um, go through that, that process um, can be really good from a feedback perspective as well. Nicole has asked about whether the STAR method would just apply to structuring examples. Um, not necessarily. I've also actually seen STAR used quite effectively in an interviewing capacity. So really what the STAR or the STAIR method does is it just helps us to elaborate upon things in an effective way. So there's that balance between really painting a picture of a situation, but also not going off on a tangent or talking about things that are irrelevant. So um, if you're given an interview question, you can be thinking about um, STAR or STAIR for that as well. So um, thank you so much. I'm just wary of time. So what I'm really keen to do, I've had um, a few educators that have asked a few questions. So um, as I mentioned, we do have the attendees list that's been provided with this webinar. So what I would be really keen to do is um, if I've recognised that maybe you have a bit more of a specific question or something that maybe requires um, a little bit more attention in terms of being able to um, provide more detail or resources, then I would be really keen to reach out to you about that. Um, so when it comes to uh, a bit of follow up, yep, we can reach out in terms of uh, letting you have access to the webinar recording and also the um, PowerPoint as well. Um, but I hope that um, it's been helpful in terms of going through a little bit of information, a bit of an overview of that starting point with preparation, with writing process, with going through what the current criteria are and how they break down. Um, so thank you so much everybody for tuning in this evening, um, particularly during the current situation. I hope that you're all safe and you're doing well. Um, and you know, if nothing else, we have afforded a bit of time at the moment to be able to focus on the application that we're putting together. So again, hopefully this um, session has been helpful for you. So thank everybody for coming along. Have a good evening.